Quick Panorama uh, on uh, weather security in the Black Sea region. Um, I'd like to thank you for, uh, for signing in and, and joining us. We are, we are having a slight problem with uh, one of our speakers who is trying to join us, Tedo Japaridze, but we decided to, to start the process and hopefully he will be joining us during the meeting. It's a technical issue. Um, again, uh, briefly, my name is Dimitri Dafilu. I'm the director of the CIS. And, and uh, th this, is a, this is a new initiative that we launched uh, very recently, uh, given the fact that most of us were stuck at home, how to communicate with the rest of the world uh, using the wonders, or not, maybe not the wonders, of, of technology. Uh, and uh, this is our second uh, installment. So we had a big discussion on um, Greek-Turkish relations uh, last week. And uh, today we decided to move ahead with uh, our expert panel uh, to talk a little bit about um, the Black Sea. So maybe I should start, uh, well, maybe uh, Mustafa, I you want to say a couple of words also since uh, both our organizations are partners in this process. Go ahead. No. Okay, thank you, Dimitri. Just, uh, just a few words. Um, let me welcome everybody also for the foreign policy talk series. As Dimitri said, this is our the second uh, installment. Uh, next week, we'll have another one, uh, this time on Cyprus. Uh, but uh, today, the focus is Black Sea. Uh, this is a cooperation between uh, Panorama, uh, which is an online platform created by International Relations Council of Turkey. Uh, about a few months ago, just when we were entering the corona uh, problem. And uh, since then, we've been working to set up it very um, successfully, I would add. And I urge you to check on it uh, in the web. Um, CS is, of course, has been a long partner of uh, UIC, International Relations Council uh, of Turkey. And now we are partnering in this foreign policy talk series. Um, thank you, Dimitri. Just welcome everybody and let's start. All right. Thank you very much, Mustafa. So today, as I said, we are waiting for one of the speakers to join us. He's having technical problems, Tedo Japaridze. But before, but uh, we, while we wait for him to join us, let, we can start. Um, the other speakers on the panel are, are um, Hanna Celeste, who is the editor in chief of uh, Ukraine Analytica uh, and, and a board member of the Foreign Policy Council, the Ukrainian Prism. Um, Hanna is a very well-known figure uh, in, uh, in terms, around the Black Sea, in terms of Black Sea security. She's been championship, uh, championing the issue as well as uh, her country's Ukraine's foreign policy. Um, she, she's one of the young generations of Ukrainians that uh, uh, are committed somehow to, to ensure that uh, some sort of uh, security framework uh, manifests itself in the region, in this difficult region. Um, and, and, and before uh, her current uh, titles, um, she was uh, for a long time a, a senior researcher at the National Institute for Strategic Studies under, under the president of Ukraine in the Odessa branch. Um, has received a number of fellowships uh, around the world and now is based in Odessa, her hometown, from where uh, she reaches out to the rest of the world. Uh, our other speaker is Alina Inaye, the director of the Black Sea Trust Regional Corporation. Um, which is based in Bucharest, and she's also the, the director of the Bucharest office of uh, the German Marshall Fund. Um, and she joined the German Marshall Fund in, in, uh, in 2007. And unlike the other of us in the panel, uh, Alina has, uh, comes from a civil society background in the sense that uh, she, has, uh, she has been an active practitioner in the field of international development democratization, having run Freedom House office in Ukraine in 2004, and the NDI office in Russia in 2000-2003. And the focus there was on civic education and, and political processes. And, and, uh, and uh, in fact, the, the, the Black Sea Trust for uh, Regional Cooperation, ever since uh, it was founded, has been very, very active in promoting uh, civil society projects all across the region. Um, and, and Mustafa Aydin, uh, my partner in crime in this, is, uh, as we just heard, the president of the International Relations Council of Turkey. He's also a colleague of mine at Kadir Has University in the Department of International Relations, where he previously served uh, for eight years as, as the rector, the president of the university. Um, 
uh, he uh, he has been very very active uh, as an academic uh, in publishing and writing and as an analyst about the Black Sea region, the Caucasus, Turkey's policies towards the region, Russia's policy towards the region, and and he and I worked together some years ago. It's been over ten years now. We produced a report uh, with the help, among others, of the Black Sea Trust. Uh, on, on uh, a 2020 vision for the Black Sea region, um, uh, where we thought, in t when we wrote this report in 2010, we thought that uh, there were ways for things to look better 10 years down the road. And as I'm thinking about this report before I, I, I give the floor to the speakers, I was just thinking whether we are at a moment uh, in time where um, uh, a, a defining moment, just like the end of the Cold War, was a defining moment uh, whereby countries, not only in the Black Sea region, but all over the world were trying to reconsider the security considerations, given the fact that bipolarity was over. And therefore, a lot of them tried to work together regionally, bilaterally, trilaterally, and regionally. Uh, and, and this happened in the Black Sea region with uh, Ankara and Russia and Moscow taking the lead in, in trying to bring together uh, in some sort of framework, uh, the country of the region. And one of these initiatives was the BSEC, the Black Sea Economic Cooperation, which evolved into an organization and now includes 12 members, not only from uh, the, the six countries around the Black Sea, but uh, other countries as well. And, and, and in dealing with a number of low politics issues on economic cooperation issues, the BSEC is still around, uh, but, but the setting has changed. And we know for over the last couple of years, uh, maybe more, we are living in not necessarily in this post-Cold War era or the American decade that many thought uh, had occurred with the end of the Cold War, but uh, we are living in a sort of a transactional world, a liquid world, whereby uh, there are many doubts as to um, whether uh, the United States is anymore, whether it wants to be, this is more the question, uh, the power among others uh, as an external stakeholder with a significant impact on the region uh, as a balancer to Moscow and, and other countries. And if it doesn't, well, maybe are we in, a, in, a, in an era at a time when we are again reconsidering what our security considerations are? Uh, and, and, and I think this is a primary issue and this is some of the things that we would like to explore. So uh, we'll start off um, with uh, maybe a couple of rounds of questions and answers from uh, from uh, the speakers and then uh, uh, anybody who wants to ask questions, please use your chat and I will try to, to accommodate you and, and uh, have the speakers respond. But the first round is uh, really, uh, we would like to hear uh, from um, the speakers, what, what is the state of security in the Black Sea region to, today? How has it changed since the end of the Cold War? Uh, and, and maybe what they can tell us since we have speakers right now from Turkey, from Romania, from Ukraine and hopefully from Georgia, uh, what are the key issues that they envision from a, both a regional perspective but even a national one, as all countries uh, uh, are, are key stakeholders? Um, so maybe I maybe I can start with uh, with Alina uh, to give us you have about five minutes to sort of tell us how you see the region right now. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dimitrios. Thank you for, uh, for inviting me as a speaker to this webinar and thank you for the question as well. I will be brief because I'm really interested into, into getting into a conversation as quick as it might be uh, over Zoom with the, with the other participants. And I'll start from what you said, um, you know, what was, is this a new defining moment? Is this a new redefining moment for, for the security uh, of the region? Because that's what you're talking about. Um, no, I don't think so. I think the redefining moment for the region and really for European security still remains 2014 and the annexation of Crimea. This has changed, this has changed the entire paradigm and the entire dynamics both in the region and, um, and even transatlantically when it comes to, uh, when it comes to security. Uh, this has changed. This is the major, the most major, major change uh, since the Cold War War. Uh, we live now in a, in a region, the Black Sea region, which, is, which, which um, functions um, under no international law, basically the international law has been violated, um, which is um, very strongly militarized, 
um, which is uh, subject to, to um, many numerous and very diverse aggressions from, uh, from Russia. It's a very, very different region and it's a very, very different sea from not only from the, from the end of the Cold War, but as I said, from uh, 2014. And I see three main, if you want to say features of, the, of, the, of, the, of these dynamics in the region, which is a very, very military one, as I said, um, first, uh, first of all, um, the, the, the rule of international law it's, it has been forged, has been violated, and we cannot really uh, uh, believe that this is going to be the guiding, the guiding uh, um, line, if you want, for all the actors um, in the region. The region uh, is extremely uh, militarized, as I said, as a result of this, but also what is extremely, extremely important is that we see um, not only in the region, but throughout the transatlantic space, a new posture of the, um, of the US, of the US um, um, army, of the US um, a military power, but maybe that's something we can, we can talk about, about later. And the big question mark, which is, I think, the question mark is a feature of the dynamics in the region, is if this will affect this, uh, this new posture that US is, uh, is designing now, if, if, if it will affect the, the Plexi region as well. It hasn't so far, but the question mark is still, is still out there. And the third very, very important feature of the region um, is that the war, the, the, the war is there. There is, a, the, the, there is a hot conflict in the region. Um, the, the, the aggression that is being done by Russia and by actors in the region is not only military, it's hybrid, it's cyber, it's interfer uh, economic interference, it's disinformation. So uh, the, the, uh, the military activity has taken many, well, not new, old, but renewed, uh, renewed forms in the region, which really complicates the entire uh, security landscape. Thank you. Thank you, Alina. Uh, very interesting. I note your points uh, about violation of international law, in particular since uh, with the annexation of Crimea in 2014. The big question mark regarding the U.S. Uh, military role and, and how aggression is more than just military. The term hybrid has also become very commonplace uh, in the region. Um, maybe next, uh, maybe I'll give the floor to Hannah. Hannah Celeste, uh, to listen to her perspective. The same question applies. Thank you, Dimitris. Uh, it is so good to speak uh, uh, in uh, this company because uh, you can skip half of your speech and just to confirm what the previous speaker um, was talking about. And uh, I will start uh, from the phrase that Alina just said that definitely 2014 was the main um, point of uh, return or no return. That is also the question for the Black Sea region in terms of the changes. And uh, uh, 1991 definitely was a certain moment of the significant changes. But at that time, for many years after this, we were thinking that, okay, this confrontation and cooperation is something natural for the Black Sea region that we've seen for uh, generations and generations. I mean, competing powers over there, they existed since the ancient times, probably. But uh, after this, we probably used to the security situation that uh, uh, were not so good, but at the same time, not dangerous in the Black Sea region. And for many years, we spoke uh, uh, about more of the soft security issues, about energy, about uh, uh, migration, about uh, uh, issues maybe with the navigation, so uh, environmental issues. But we were not following that much the hard security issues. And what 2000, um, 14 really changed that we uh, started to speak about the Black Sea region from the classical hard security point of view. We started to speak again about capacities and capabilities. We started to count number of naval ships and the uh, uh, types of the weapons that we have. But at the same time, it seems to me that the last six years also demonstrated that the Black Sea region became a certain um, testing ground, let's say, yeah, for not only this hybrid uh, warfare um, that we included too many things sometimes in this term, but also about the changes of uh, uh, visions and the uh, uh, probably understanding of the role of Navy and the capacities and capabilities that uh, national armies of this region uh, really need. 
And if you analyze the Navi strategies or security uh, strategies of the countries uh, around the region, or even if some of them, as Turkey is not publishing these documents openly, but we know some information from there, or we see the procurements uh, that these countries are uh, um, taking uh, for the last few years, we see that, first of all, countries to, uh, start to speak not about multilateral initiatives, we speak less and less about the collective security in the Black Sea region. Uh, we all forgot about Black Sea 4 and Black Sea Harmony, but even without them, we started to think that, uh, and uh, we have evidences that countries more and more are working with their coastal guards. So countries are working with the idea how to protect their coast, how to protect uh, their seaports, and uh, how to use and what alternatives are for logistics, first of all, for military logistics, in case there are any problems with Bosporus. And here, uh, let's be honest, uh, yet one uh, um, very big topic, elephant in the room, it is uh, the Turkish position about Montreux Convention and the possibilities of working with certain clauses of this convention especially in the relations between Turkey and uh, uh, the Russian Federation. That's what uh, many countries around the region, and not only the same for the US and uh, a few of our European partners, who are waiting for the certain uh, uh, articulation of the Turkish position. What can be the case when Turkey uh, is ready to close Bosporus for the Russian military uh, ships, Navy ships, uh, in case of any uh, um, jeopardizing to the either national security of Turkey or to the situation in the Middle East or in the Black Sea. So what is that reason that would uh, uh, trigger Turkey uh, to uh, prevent Russia from passing the Bosphorus or maybe some other countries, literal countries in the region? So coming from here, I would definitely like to speak, uh, uh, I skip everything about the international law here, uh, Alina perfectly described uh, this problem. Uh, it seems to me that the main characteristic of today uh, Black Sea region, first of all, it is the lack of multilateralism, or let's say the loss of multilateralism spirit that we used to have 10 years ago. And it is not only uh, importance, uh, not from the important, but importance of, uh, uh, of BSEC, but because of the national egoism of some of the countries as well. So first of all, it is lack or loss of multilateralism. The second is the back to the hard security as a top priority. And the third trend that we are starting witnessing now that the uh, other big actors, um, uh, they are not returning because they've never been a serious actors yet, but trying to formulate their vision and their uh, position about the Black Sea region. Here we speak about the United States, and we saw how the last year the interest in Washington started to increase. Uh, the second is NATO, that is also is speaking about formulating a certain strategy uh, for this region. Uh, and uh, we see European Union who is trying to reshape maybe their Black Sea strategy and few others. So uh, China as well, Japan as well. So it seems to me that the next few years will be about them uh, being with the uh, better articulated position about the Black Sea region. Well, thank, thank you very much. Um, all very interesting. Uh, does not paint necessarily a, a pretty picture. But uh, we'll talk in round two about uh, maybe how to move forward. Uh, and, and you've actually asked some very poignant questions, which uh, I think uh, Mustafa Aydin, and let's hear your perspective. And very interesting also regarding Montreux and, and the issue of maritime security, which is really emerging as, as a crucial issue uh, for the security of the region. Mustafa, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Dimitri. I'll leave the Montreux to the discussions and uh, go right into the uh, topic. Uh, as you mentioned, um, our paper on 2020, Vision for 2020, and it's already 2020. Uh, in that paper, uh, we thought of some um, remedies or, or policies that if, if employed by the actors, 
uh, in the region, uh, uh, it could they could have prevented what we end up today. Uh, and obviously nobody uh, really read our paper or they didn't care what we wrote. So nobody employed those um, suggestions or advices yes, and right. we are we are where we are, right? <laughs> you know. Uh, but I put the, I put a link um, to that report in the chat if anybody wants to uh, look at it. Uh, what we saw about 10 years ago in the region. Um, so I, I'll, I agree with both of our speakers, Hannah and Alina, of course. 2014 was the defining moment for the uh, region in recent years, but 2014 moment did not start in 2014. Uh, it was 2008 uh, that the moment really started. And the sins of the 2008 uh, got us where uh, where we where we get uh, in 2014, um, and since 2014 everything started to going downhill. Of course, so the biggest challenge I would also agree with everybody here that the biggest challenge of security in the region today is the Russian challenge. Uh, the Russian challenge is is number of different aspects. Of course, one aspect already mentioned that this hybrid hybrid threat uh, that it is posing to different countries in the region. Uh, but also the second aspect related to this uh, hybrid threat, but also uh, wider than that, is uh, AD, uh, A2, AD zones that Russia has created in the, around the Black Sea. It's not only Crimea, where everybody knows uh, about Russian A2, AD zone, but also there is another zone on the border of uh, Armenia, between border of Armenia and Turkey. So there is already two zones there. And of course, if you uh, add the missiles and everything else within the Russian territory, then Russia uh, had created uh, a, a zone in the Black Sea, which is very difficult to penetrate for the outside forces now. Uh, and another uh, aspect of this Russian challenge is the uh, increasing power uh, and renovation of Black sea, Russian Black Sea fleet. Uh, as you know, uh, Russia also took uh, Ukrainian share of the former Soviet Black Sea uh, fleet, most of it, uh, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, about 70% of it when it, uh, it got Crimea. Uh, so what we end up now, uh, if you look at the sea territories uh, in the water territories in the, in the Black Sea, it's very si it looks like very similar to what we had during the Cold War. You know, Russia controlling uh, much of the, at least almost half of the Black Sea now, uh, and have the dominant navy in the Black Sea. Uh, this has happened since 2014. Uh, and before then, it was, as you know, uh, there was some sort of an, at least an equilibrium uh, between uh, a Turkish navy and Russian navy. This is has changed. So this is a, a challenge that we have to uh, address somehow. I don't know how. Uh, but we'll talk about it. Uh, and this will be, this is linked my to second point. Of course, Hannah is already mentioned. Uh, she said the loss of uh, multilateral cooperation and my note was almost similar, loss of regional cooperation vision. So it's the same thing actually. Uh, as a result of what happened between 2008 and 2014, uh, the, the vision that brought us after the uh, end of the Cold War that brought us to, to up to 2008, uh, that the vision of multilateral cooperation in the, uh, during, uh, within the Black Sea region uh, has collapsed. Uh, there is no appetite in any country in the region whatsoever, maybe except Turkey, uh, to cooperate with Russia anymore. Uh, and of course, Turkish cooperation is uh, bilateral and ha has different dimensions than the Black Sea cooperation. Uh, and this is, of course, uh, it's not only due to Russian uh, challenge and resurgence, but also uh, the other factors uh, also important. Turkey is changing its focus from the, uh, from the region and fo refocusing its, its policies and, and eyes into the Middle East uh, has uh, affected this. And also, I would say the Western withdrawal in general uh, after 2008 has uh, affected to this loss of regional uh, cooperation vision. And finally, of course, what, uh, uh, related to all this is 
uh, we should not forget this frozen conflict. You know, I mean, because we are talking the new conflicts, let's not, not forget the old style uh, frozen conflicts, uh, which are there since the end of the Cold War, and they're still there. And they always complicate the issues and also help this Russian challenge or exaggerate this Russian challenge as well. Uh, it weakens the regional actors, uh, helps uh, countries uh, with a, a dominant vision to, uh, to shape the region. And all this relates, I think, another problem in the region. It, 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 if you define security in a wider context, it's a problem. It's the weakening of sovereignty of nations in the region and representative democracy. Uh, this is, uh, for, for various reasons and many reasons, of course, happening. Uh, but nevertheless, the end result is weakening of many, many uh, regimes in the region, both domestically and internationally. Uh, and, uh, uh, and that will be, of course, affecting this loss of uh, multilateral vision. Uh, it's also affecting the increasing influence of Russia and etc. So this is, these are, I think, the current key, key challenges uh, to the region. And this, all of all this together, if you, if you take all this together, it's moving uh, towards a kind of a, a primacy of hard security in the region now, uh, as we saw during the Cold War. I mean, since the end of the Cold War, hard security was kind of pushed behind for all this talk of technical and economic cooperation and et cetera, uh, even though everybody realized Everybody knew these problems, hard security problems there, but they they all tried to push it to the back uh, of their minds. But now it's this hard security issues uh, came to dominate the region. And in this kind of a region, I don't see how uh, we will be able to 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 develop a new policy or something way out. Let me stop here. All the Okay, uh, well, very interesting. Um, interesting. I mean, it's the same leaf motif that we've heard so far. And um, it's not necessarily a very pleasant situation, but it's a very real one. Uh, I've just received a word from Ted. He's having connection problems, so he probably cannot join us. He, he has a problem back home. And uh, uh, anyway, so we can continue with our discussion. Because the, the second round, I mean, I, I've listened to you very carefully. I'm taking copious notes. Um, uh, and, and I was just thinking about the second question that uh, I have in mind, I, I had asked you to sort of uh, examine is, A, is this current situation, which is what it is, with uh, militarization being on the rise or hard security being on the rise in the region tenable? What could happen? What could it lead to? And, and of course, uh, Mustafa tried to answer part of the part of the second question, which was also: Is it possible to develop, in this context, some sort of uh, security complex, to reduce tensions, and if possible, how? Uh, because we are at a sort of breaking point, um, and 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 uh, these are maybe we will go again, uh, starting with Alina, to see. Uh, what you guys think. And also, I'm just thinking also, Alina, about other issues. I mean, I, I mentioned the work you do and the, the work you do on a daily basis with the Black Sea Trust and funding civil society projects, funding youth projects and others. Are those in this environment, is this just to maintain some sort of sanity or do we actually, can these develop into mechanisms eventually among civil society at large that can balance off this hardcore militarization? And if, if we are moving away from the model that occurred at the immediate end of the Cold War, which was a regional thing, so the BSEC was included all the countries, even though it's had its problems, right? Uh, can we maybe move to some sort of regional or sub-regional cooperation? And is this a way also forward? Um, I mean, it exists and it really doesn't exist, but is this maybe a way forward? The floor is yours, Alina. Uh, a lot of questions. Let me start with the first one. Is the situation tenable? Listen, do we want it to be tenable? I mean, the situation, it's not at our advantage as it is. So um, it might be tenable if we continue the way we've done so far, which is to let, uh, to, to let uh, Russia have the, have the upper hand, but we want it to be tenable. I think we don't. Um, and I also see, it in, 
a lot of signs from uh, from uh, international organizations and from countries around the region that they don't want this uh, this situation to be uh, to be to be tenable. How we change it? How we go about changing it without uh, without creating a even bigger mess in the region to put it this way. Um, and I think Mustafa somewhat uh, somewhat hinted at it. First of all, we need we need increased deterrence in the region. We need to have a stronger posture. NATO needs to have a stronger posture. Other international organizations need to have a stronger posture to do away with the uh, A to uh, A to A D uh, domination uh, domination of Russia. Um, and again, there are very many signs. There are good signs that, as Hannah said lately, um, the Black Sea region is getting higher and higher on the agenda within NATO, within uh, within EU. Um, so this is this is a good sign. But we need even more seriousness when uh, from these organizations, from these institutions, from NATO. First of all, um, when it comes to 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 uh, as I said, increasing, strengthening, uh, strengthening our posture, and from the from the literal states uh, as well. Um, the big weaknesses, the two big weaknesses that I see, I actually know there are three that I noted. Um, naval security, we are still weak, we are still divided here. This is, the Montreal Convention doesn't help either, but that's a different, uh, different conversation. That's, that needs to be addressed. Military mobility in the region, in the countries uh, around, around the sea itself. Um, and then I'll come back to the non-military actions, to so the hybrid actions, where again, we are, we are uh, one step behind, uh, one step behind Russia uh, at least. So these are the three main priorities that I see need to be addressed in order to not make the current situation tenable. Um, when it comes to regional cooperation and when it comes to uh, to regional uh, complex of security, uh, if you want, now this is very complicated. It's been complicated in the in the last years. Conversations never really went. Uh, uh, very far when it comes to a, to a um, really regional, um, you know, security security uh, cooperation. But there are regional formats whatsoever where some things happen. Maybe they do not, not include all of the countries. I, I'm not talking about Russia here. Um, maybe they do not include some of the countries. But in different combinations, um, uh, countries in the Black Sea region are coming together to address security issues. Um, I'm talking about the benign here, the benign format, where a lot of um, a lot of good decisions have been pushed forward under this format. I'm even talking about the Three Seas Initiative, which does have a security uh, security component. And there, when it comes to the naval security, there are um, well still talks, but however, even initiatives actually between different uh, literal literal states. So there are things. Uh, there are things which are being attempted, and there are uh, there are even little successes to some um, almost regional formats, to put it this way. Um, civil society and can regional cooperation um, among civil civil society uh, help um, lead the, um, to help uh, diminish the pressure in the region? Yes, it can. First of all, civil society is extremely active. Uh, when it comes to disinformation and countering uh, Russian and Chinese uh, fake news, uh, that's that that this tendency and this speciali specialization is growing within civil society in all of the countries in the region. This is something that uh, we've been we we the international community have been nurturing for the first years, and it's showing uh, some signs of success. So at least when it comes to this, yes, civil society is extremely important. Um, but then civil society, and not only civil society, media as well, um, is extremely uh, important when it comes to creating and nurturing a culture of security. Populations in the countries in the Black Sea region do not have a culture of security. They do not understand the threats. They do not um, understand, understand the, the vulnerabilities. Um, they do not understand the urgencies of some situation, and they are very easily uh, uh, manipulated. So a, a culture of security needs to be cultivated in, in the countries in the Black Sea region. And again, civil society and media um, are playing a, a very important role here. Thank you, Alina. You know, as you were talking also about the hybrid uh, action and then civil society, I, I remember today one of your colleagues from the Balkan Trust for Democracy on, on Facebook had actually put a very nice chart about and with a question, who gives the most aid to Serbia? And, and it has, two diagrams. One is 
Who, who do Serbians think give the most aid? 40% China, EU 17%, Russia 14%, others 27%. And who actually gives Serbia the most aid? Well, 1.819 million euros the EU, then Germany 189 million, then the US 161, then the UN 141, China and Russia nowhere there. But it's very interesting how this, uh, this battle is being played also, and it's having an impact also on how civil society functions. And, and, and therefore, uh, the same thing in terms of hybrid uh, misinformation, disinformation is occurring in the Black Sea region. But uh, so can, I, can I add something here, Dimitrios, because it's very important. If you ask the same question about Serbia in Germany or anywhere else in Europe, everybody has the same perception. It's true. So it's not only it's the true. Serbs perceiving this, it's everybody perceiving the same thing. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Hannah, same questions, floor is yours. Uh, thanks a lot, um, Dimitris. Uh, first of all, it's um, definitely the question how we can uh, uh, reduce the tensions. And here we can go from the top level to the uh, our more uh, local sub-regional levels because there are a lot of tensions. But however, one big um, in the middle of everything is the Russian Federation. And I understand as being Ukrainian, I uh, could be perceived as, or oh, you're always blaming Russia, but let's be honest, uh, when you go to Moldova, uh, the situation with Transnistria is understandable. The forces are still there, even that they needed to be uh, withdrawn back in 1999. Uh, Georgia, the same situation with Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Uh, we go even to Nagorno-Karabakh situation. Again, we can see the Russian hand, even if their Azerbaijan and Armenia are perfectly um, uh, doing worse with the security situation by themselves, but with the Russian assistant, it's coming even uh, better uh, I'm, when you put it in the brackets. But uh, uh, currently, definitely, the biggest problem, it is the lack of the trust, and this lack of the trust is coming because of the... Uh, Crimean annexation. Not just from the fact of annexation, because some people can say, oh, it's just a piece of land, but the question is how many norms of the international law were violated? And if we accept it, yes, we as an expert can be cynical enough and to say that any agreements are just the gentleman agreements and uh, I, it's up to us to change what have been signed in Helsinki, but let's be honest, the international order for the last several centuries are based on certain international agreements that the partners agreed to limit themselves or to cooperate or to do something. So as soon as we still agree that the international agreements and conventions and treaties and everything means something, so uh, we should look to Crimea from the completely different uh, situation. It's not just an accession of the land. It is violation of all of those principles, not even norms, but first of all principles by which uh, even the Soviet Union and the United States lived back uh, in the 1970s, 80s, uh, and so on. So uh, the second problem, it is this disorder that is created. It is the uh, complete feeling of uncertainty because you can't be sure what and how will happen next day. Because back uh, on the 1st of January of 2014, Ukraine couldn't imagine that something like this could happen. So most of the countries with which Russia has the relations, again, are not sure uh, who will be the uh, next one or how it uh, can happen. Not speaking about the greater militarization of the region, because definitely what is happening with the uh, um, uh, with Crimea now, it's not only the Black Sea fleet, it is the whole complex of the very heavy militarization of the region. And uh, the next one is the human rights. It is violation of the ethnic minorities, of the rights of Crimean Tatars, of the Ukrainians. There is something that Europe already forgot that uh, can happen. So it seems to me that without uh, resolving this situation, you can't say that tensions will disappear. You can't start trading or doing the big projects of the high Black Sea Highway or something like this if you can't address the core of the problem. As soon as we will be afraid to speak about what is the real problem of all this instability, um, tensions, uh, uh, lack of trust in the region, it will be very difficult uh, to be honest with ourselves and to make a proper strategic appraisal of the region. But at the same time, I can agree that sub-regional security 
uh, where a formulation of the certain subregional alliances uh, can be of the interest. Here, the question is definitely whom with whom, so not to make even greater lines of competition or the confrontation in the region. But uh, here it seems to me is also interesting that the um, external players are quite an interesting in the possible sub-regional security arrangement. And for example, the uh, uh, dialogue of the trialogue that is happening between uh, Poland, Romania, and Turkey annually. That's something very unique that we couldn't expect before, but it really gives a hope that it can be different arrangements uh, within this region, different engagement. What started to, uh, to be more and more active since 2014, the Ukrainian-Romanian security dialogue. The drills, uh, the military exercises that we had at the Danube or in the Black Sea, recently among the Coast Guards, uh, honestly, that's something I couldn't imagine back in uh, 2012, because at that time, some politicians in Ukraine preferred to describe Romania as the, if not competitor, so even the enemy, or that it is Romania that would like to annex some of the Ukrainian parts. And now this crisis of 2014 really demonstrated uh, with whom it's better to cooperate more effective and where we still have their uh, horizons and perspectives for this cooperation. Ukraine and Georgia is something that I probably even don't need to describe because that is since the uh, very beginning of independence for both states were always uh, very important. It's just different capacities that we have. But because of this, uh, probably like Alina already talked about naval cooperation that we need on NATO uh, here. And because all of this, I just remembered about the new word that we are starting to use more and more, it is resilience. Resilience is a topic that is giving more uh, opportunities for the Black Sea countries for um, also security cooperation. Uh, especially if we go to the resilience from the uh, NATO seven baselines that they describe. And I know that two years ago, uh, in the NATO headquarters, the Black Sea countries already started to speak about what can be the Black Sea resilience. Can it be regional resilience, or can we speak only about national resilience? And uh, in October, it's still planned. With this pandemic, we don't know what will be in practice, but at least it was announced and planned, that the first NATO-Ukrainian resilience exercises for the Black Sea region should take place. 200 people, uh, including all types of ministries, so not only military, and that is returning to the hybrid threat that we are talking about. So those involved with the information security of the country, cybersecurity of the country, public opinion, media, or transport, uh, ethnic minorities, all of them should be involved in these exercises together with the NATO officials and affiliated like uh, centers of excellency. Because uh, people understand that uh, probably total defense is uh, something difficult to achieve and very expensive uh, because we can't uh, just establish total security in the Black Sea region. We know all our limitations. So at least we can speak about resilience. And uh, that is a topic that really can bring both civil society and governmental institutions in the Black Sea region. It can involve those countries which are hesitating, like Bulgaria, uh, for security cooperation in the region. But through resilience, we can raise more and more of the security concerns that we currently have uh, within the region. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, very comprehensive uh, sort of ideas that uh, one can work from. Um, Mustafa. And then after you're done, we'll take some questions. There are three or four people, very interesting questions that people are asking. Okay, thank you. Uh, is it ten tenable? As Alina said, yes, if you accept the uh, conditions and, and uh, uh, attach conditions attached to, to the situation. Um, but I, most countries in the region do not like what they are dealt with currently. Um, however, the problem is beyond the region. And most of the countries in the world, and in, I think the Black Sea countries also included in this, are in a kind of a waiting mood uh, to see where the current volatility in international politics are going to take us. Because there is this 
a kind of very fluid character of international relations today. Uh, and the militarization and securitization uh, is, uh, is kind of an order of the day, globally, everywhere. So we cannot really uh, remove Black Sea from that kind of a threat. Uh, and the countries and, and the powers who can change the situation in the Black Sea uh, or have the ability to change the situation in the Black Sea are also caught up in this fluidity. Um, they are dealing with different regions, they are looking uh, different dimensions of international politics, and they are not committing themselves at the moment. Uh, and the Black Sea seems to be a small uh, player in the pot here, or, or small uh, token in the, in the pot. So not, uh, focus is not getting uh, into the region. Um, in order to change uh, the situation in the Black Sea, of course, and offer some sort of a hope for the future, what is needed is a kind of a, 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 a overall change of current policies, priorities, focuses uh, of several actors who used to be very active in the Black Sea region. Uh, and I don't see this is happening, by the way, but I have to mention, I, I think this is the only way uh, to change the current uh, situation, security situation in the Black Sea, and maybe to develop something uh, for the region. Otherwise, I don't see a much, much chance. One of the actors is, of course, my country, Turkey. Uh, Turkey's focus is not in the Black Sea, and I, I don't know how long will it take that it will come back to the Black Sea, uh, but it's needed. Turkey is the only regional country that can uh, not anymore balance Russia itself, but that can play a role balancing Russia with other actors in the region. If you take out Turkey, there is no other country which can affect, uh, a create a, a grouping in the region which uh, somehow balances the Russian position. So you, we need to bring back Turkey into the Black Sea uh, if there is going to be a change in the Black Sea security situation. The second is, of course, EU. Um, the EU, I've always been very critical, uh, those who, have, who know me uh, about the Black Sea issues, when I talk about the Black Sea issues, I have always been very critical about the EU position in the Black Sea and also in the Caucasus. Uh, and I think EU position, if there is a position at all now, has to change very radically. Uh, and uh, one of my criticism all, has always been EU have never really cooperated uh, with Turkey in the region. My focus, uh, my argument has always been that EU position and Turkish position usually uh, go next to each other without cooperating and sometimes really clashed in the past. Currently, of course, we don't see um, two actors are really clashing in the region because they are not there anymore anyway. Uh, and the U.S. is, of course, need to sharpen its, uh, its position in the region. I'm not sure whether the U.S. has a position in the region anymore. I mean, since 2007, more or less, 2008 was the nail. Uh, but after 2014, what is the U.S. position in the region except uh, having, um, trying to punish Russia uh, with, its, uh, with its economic uh, aspects of the, um, uh, his, his dealing with Russia. Uh, so you, do I see that these changes in these three powers and actors, the policies of these three powers and actors? No, I don't. Unfortunately, as I said, in the current situation, I don't see. So that's why I don't see much uh, changing um, current salamate in, in the Black Sea. But uh, many people are forgetting now uh, that even this kind of a focus is not enough. You know, it, Crimea was not the first instance of violation of inter rules of international law in the Black Sea region. In almost, well, not almost, I think it, in all uh, frozen conflicts in the Black Sea, international rules uh, were violated. Uh, in, in Nagorno-Karabakh, in Apazia, in South Ossetia, and, and in, finally in Crimea now, which is becoming, I think, also uh, another frozen conflict in, in the region. 
So unless we go back to basics and start discussing uh, honestly and kind of uh, forcing a jumpstart solution uh, for starting maybe from the oldest frozen conflict, uh, trying to solve them. Otherwise, we honestly do this. Uh, there is no way of uh, uh, trying to create a security environment because these problems prevented creation of security zone in the region in the past. And not, nothing has changed except maybe new problems added, being added daily. Um, so we have to go back to the older problems and trying to start solving them uh, if we want to do anything. Uh, in the absence of all this, as I said, uh, you know, my I don't expect these are these to be happening. Uh, so, in the absence of all this, my suggestion is for the NATO members and NATO partner countries in the region. Um, maybe they could start intensifying their own cooperation uh, and their own uh, co coordination between their own policies vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russian challenge that I spoke of in the first uh, first. Uh, time I spoke. Uh, alignment of their policies, close cooperation are needed. Uh, it's not there. Uh, uh, and to overcome even the, you know, sometimes the reluctance of some countries, including Turkey. If Turkey is not very willing uh, to invest more in the Black Sea or focus in the Black Sea, then the other current countries in the region, which are worrying about the situation, have to invest more trying to pull Turkey back to the, uh, to the Black Sea. Uh, as I said, without the Turkey in the region, there is no sort of a, a grouping uh, which can uh, create a balancing situation in the Black Sea region. By the way, this balance, the equilibrium in the Black Sea was the behind the reason for the multilateral cooperation initiative succeeded in the region. You know, let us not be very, let us not be very, and naive to suppose that uh, you know liberalism Trump uh, was triumph triumphant in the, in the Black Sea. It was the re reality of the balance or equilibrium in the military sector that forced Russia uh, in a position uh, uh, within the multilateral cooperation. So they were kind of contained there. Once that uh, military position has changed, everything changed. So let me stop here. Thank you. Uh, thank you for very comprehensive uh, answers. Let me go quickly to the questions. We'll just do a run over maybe 10 minutes. Um, uh, there are four or five questions here. I think we've touched upon some of the things. I mean, maybe Mustafa, continuing to what you were saying, there's a question from Oksana Andre regarding um, energy projects in and around the Black Sea uh, and Turkey's role there and, and Russian-Turkish cooperation. And so you've answered the part about Turkey playing a role to diffuse tensions, but uh, the energy equation is, is interesting in that sense. And then maybe also uh, Ambassador Hassan Gurgush uh, writes that uh, he was one of the drafters of uh, the C, uh, CBMs uh, in the Black Sea region in the 1990s, which the US was not very sympathetic uh, about. And what happens to those ideas? Uh, so maybe we start with you, Mustafa, you can quickly answer. Um, and then there's one also linked, it's not linked, it's a, boy, a bit of a loaded question, I think, but from Hassan Yilmaz uh, about uh, does Russia enhance stability in the region against Western interventionism, which is exactly what we, the opposite of what we've been talking about, but uh, it's interesting. So maybe Mustafa very quickly, and then I'll give the floor to also to Alina and, uh, and Hannah. Put on your mic. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, quickly, um, for Roxana's question, um, one of the assumptions in the, behind this question is, of course, uh, Turkey's need for energy cooperation uh, in the Black Sea. Uh, something very interesting happening in recent months. Uh, um, since the prices of oil have um, taken a deep plunge uh, and also affecting the uh, natural gas prices uh, in the free market, Turkey has been uh, diversifying its resources. And now, I, I don't have figures with me now, but uh, I was attending some other meeting and I heard um, that now Turkey is buying 
more uh, natural gas from uh, free market, uh, spot market, uh, than Russia. Um, and Russia, as you know, was about 50-55% of Turkey's uh, uh, Turkey's dependence on Russian gas was 55% before all this started, and I think it's now all, it's declined now. Like maybe 25% of Turkey's gas is now coming from Russia. So this is very interesting. Uh, if this is going to continue, uh, uh, then we might see some changes because, uh, of course, a new line uh, uh, from um, new gas from Azerbaijan is also uh, coming into Turkey. Uh, and and be, with the addition of this spot market, uh, Turkey might be in a position to renegotiate uh, its deals with Russia because most of Turkey's deals with Russia is ending uh, uh, by the end of two, 2021. Uh, so that I think it's it's some it's, it's there, there would be some very interesting moments to watch uh, on this um, uh, dependency here, uh, but. Uh, I don't see Turkey currently with the Turkey's current uh, diversity of foreign policy problems and issues uh, and the places that Turkey is very active. I don't see Turkey coming back into the Black Sea uh, and trying to deal with the challenge of Russia. Uh, Turkey is uh, already very much engaged with Russia in different issues and trying to balance all, that, uh, all of these together, which is a very difficult act, I don't see uh, another issue from Turkish decision makers, another region that is Black Sea to come back and to make the, uh, make the relations more difficult. So Syria is already very much loaded, and now the Libya is added, uh, uh, and somehow Black uh, Caucasus is not talked about Tur between Turkey and Russia. Um, so. In short, again, I don't see much of Turkey coming back to the region um, to balance Russia. Uh, for the ambassador's question, I think I, I don't follow the American position on the Black Sea anymore. I don't know whether they have any position. Maybe Alina could say us something on this. So I'll jump the ball to Alina. <laughs> okay. What? Before I give the floor to Alina also, I mean, uh, there is another question also that you might want to consider, which is, um, I mean, it was partly addressed by all of you, a question by, from Ishik uh, Gurleyen regarding uh, well, the withdrawal of the West from the region and why the three members of the EU and NATO are not being able to engage with Western actors. So uh, three EU members, I mean, we consider the wider region, it's Greece, Romania, and Bulgaria. Uh, NATO, it's four members, including Turkey in that sense. Um, and so, this is also something we've, we've sort of alluded to, but maybe you can answer, ask, answer that question together with a question that Mustafa passed on to you. Okay, go ahead. You're on, you're on. I know, I know. The, the US position um, um, on the Black Sea, listen, I think, I think it's pretty straightforward and it's pretty and it's pretty clear. Uh, the U.S. is very interested in uh, both the eastern flank and the Black Sea because the eastern flank does include all the other countries all the way up to the Baltic Sea, and probably we should be talking about the Baltic Sea as well. And I think it's been made, it, it's, it made very clear um, this position with the missile uh, missile shield that elements of the missile shield that uh, it installed in uh, in Romania and. Um, uh, in other countries in the region as well. Also, the US is a constant uh, participant in, in all of the military exercise, naval and non-naval um, exercises in the Black Sea. So its interest in the Black Sea and its, uh, some, its commitment to the Black Sea, I think it has been uh, proven over the, past, uh, over the past few years. Now, there is a caveat to this. Um, as I was saying earlier, we can see um, that the U.S. is reconsidering its military posture worldwide, um, not only in the Black Sea. I don't even think Black Sea is necessarily very high on the um, on the list, but uh, but but throughout throughout the world, um, including in Europe, um, will this new posture that they are designing and they are even threatening with, I might say. Um, will this new posture eventually affect the Black Sea, and we'll see. Um, um, 
a, a withdrawal or at least a reduction in their interest in the Black Sea. It remains to be seen. It very much depends on, um, on um, uh, the upcoming elections in the, in the United States as well. So this is the unknown, uh, unknown that I was, I was actually mentioning in the, um, in the beginning of my, of, my opening, uh, of my opening remarks. Uh, but the, the the U.S. position and the U.S. interest in the Black Sea has been has been has been proven throughout the the past uh, few years, starting with 2014. That's when they actually woke uh, woke up. As about the other uh, question regarding the three uh, EU members, again, I'm. I think they've done a good deal of their part. They could have definitely done more. But again, um, when you consider the, the, the NATO Warsaw Summit and everything that was discussed there and uh, decided there and everything that's been, that has been implemented after the, the, the Warsaw Summit, um, this is a result of the intense lobby and activity and advocacy and effort um, of the countries in the Black Sea region. Um, so, at least Romania, to a certain extent Bulgaria, also Poland, which is not mentioned here, um, they have been very active in promoting the interests uh, of, the, um, of the Black Sea. Could they have done more? Definitely. Definitely. There, there is much to be done um, and it remains to be seen to what, to what extent uh, they, will, they, will, um, they will increase their efforts. So the, the, the short answer is no, I don't think they're failing. Maybe they are not getting an A grade, but they're not failing. Okay, uh, let's move on to Hannah. There's also a question in particular. I mean, you can answer some of the other ones, but there's the first question, which has to do with Ukraine. As you saw from uh, Fulkan Terzi, who I think has not with us anymore, but he, he was asking about the Ukraine's position uh, with, with regard to Russia since uh, Zelensky has uh, become president of Ukraine. And, um, and then also I'll just put the last question which came from Mitter Aykut and maybe even Mustafa could answer later, but also uh, you, Hannah. I mean, there's a big debate in, uh, in Turkey in particular about reshoring, especially in light of COVID-19. And we saw everyone needing supplies from China, medical equipment, PPEs and everything else. And so one of the Turkish arguments is, well, we are more dependable than the Chinese. Uh, use us as a production facility uh, for all this strategic equipment and so on. So the, the question is, uh, is this something possible and how do, can the Black Sea nations cooperate around this and become a regional supplier and, then, and therefore whether this contributes to some sort of regional security. So, Hannah. Thank you very much, uh, Dimitris. Uh, so very quickly, a question by question. First of all, um, about the uh, uh, Zelensky position uh, uh, towards Russia, we see that his position has been evolving uh, during uh, the year. So definitely Zelensky now is not Zelensky that we uh, as a country elected back in April uh, 2019. And his position towards Russia became much stronger um, less uh, uh, compromised uh, with the better articulation and better understanding of the threat. So if in the very beginning he was avoiding naming Russia as an aggressor, uh, he was very human-centric in his uh, uh, vision of the conflict in the east of Ukraine and uh, he was speaking about a lot of humanitarian initiatives and was almost forgetting about security. So reality on the ground and his first uh, negotiations, direct negotiations with Vladimir Putin back in December, uh, definitely opened his eyes and we see that his position is developing. Uh, it's still uh, that one of a little bit of sophistic approach that uh, he definitely would like to finish this uh, uh, crisis as soon as possible. But at the same time, uh, he is already speaking about all security concerns and he is understanding that it is unfortunately he will not be able to finish the conflict by the end of this year as he uh, dreamt uh, a, a year ago. So uh, it seems to me that uh, soon uh, we probably can see the new vision from his side. We still don't have a strategy. And about Russia, he is uh, dividing people and uh, obviously diversifying people and Kremlin. So he is still very much within the uh, Russian slash Soviet cultural uh, uh, circle because of his business, past business. 
but uh, I think he's becoming more and more Ukrainian centric uh, than uh, what we've seen before. And uh, uh, coming with the China, you know, for Ukraine, China is the biggest uh, trade partner as well. And, uh, uh, but at the same time, we can't say that we are dependent on it. Because here it is quite an interesting situation. There are mostly the uh, uh, supplies that we used to buy from AliExpress and so on that the last years were increasing. But at the same time, China is interesting in Ukrainian goods as well, even that we are with a negative balance still. I don't believe in the Black Sea suppliers uh, or be, be, to become a supplier and the reason for cooperation, because unfortunately, I think that is a reason for competition. And what we can see now that when the European countries, when the United States are starting to speak about uh, moving their manufacturing from China to other countries, many of the Eastern European countries, including the Black Sea countries, will be competitors to where these investments will come, where the new enterprises can appear. So uh, that is definitely not uh, the same as we had with energy in the Black Sea region. It's not the question where Ukraine and Turkey would become partners. That is where we'll be uh, at least perceiving ourselves as the competitors for these uh, new possibilities. But at the same time, Ukraine has just started to developing the Asian strategy. So we are definitely still searching our vision and position about China. And here it's also the question of uh, probably um, balancing with other Asian partners and where the Black Sea region can find themselves, because we know that Japan is very interesting in the Black mm -hmm. Sea. So maybe Japan can become that third actor that will unite. It, it has country. always been. It has always well, been Japan. It's always been, especially in Guam. Uh, it is one of the biggest supporters of Guam idea. And it will be really interesting to see uh, how Japan maybe will develop its position um, in the region. And very short command of three of the questions that we had here about uh, the U.S. Um, first of all, let's be honest why the U.S. was not involved that much. Um, there are two reasons. Reason number one, especially when we speak about the U.S. within NATO, because Turkey promised that they are the best channel of communication, that Turkey is protecting the interest. And uh, it was easier to, when there were still very good relations between Turkey, uh, uh, let's say Ankara and Washington. Uh, U.S. was busy in Afghanistan or in Iraq. They trusted uh, Turkey here. Then in 2014, uh, the realization came that probably that information from Turkey was not enough or Turkey was too uh, soft towards Russia. Now we can only say why it's happened, but, but, but it is a reality. At the same time, we know uh, Trump's position that he thinks that Europeans should deal with their issues by themselves. And for the last few years, he was promoting this a lot. That's why um, the United States was not looking for the new regions for increasing their uh, presence. And Black Sea was quite a peaceful from their uh, side comparing to other uh, regions. But uh, what I really started to see for the last uh, few months is that at the expert level, of those think tanks which are really um, involved in the policy making and decision making, so not the academician, but the, the, those who are really involved in the Washington uh, uh, policy making, uh, they started to organize more and more events, closed door and open door about uh, the Black Sea. They are trying to formulate a position of the United States about the Black Sea. So it seems to me that after uh, presidential elections, we will see probably a more coherent and articulated U.S. position. And very small comment about one of the questions that I was really surprised to read from one of our participants, that don't you think Russia enhances stability in the region against Western interventionism? Honestly, I just would like to ask, uh, is this person thinks that killing 10,000 people um, in the east of the neighboring country uh, is uh, um, enhancing stability or arresting Crimean uh, Tatars daily, it is enhancing stability. So probably our um, perception of stability is very different. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hannah, for uh, answering the question. Maybe uh, Mustafa or Alina, you want to add something else before we close? Mustafa, there's also the question about Montreux, which was never answered very nicely. You avoided it. Um, but especially the question about uh, 
China and reshoring and this whole thing, whether uh, this could play a role. I mean, we heard uh, Alina, we heard uh, Hannah's uh, perspective. Maybe you have something to say. And then, um, yeah, we have one minute. Yeah, I, yeah. I never avoid any questions. Uh, you know, I don't see I mean, any. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't see any any relevancy of discussing Montreux here. Uh, I, I don't agree with any anybody who opposes Montreux. I mean, I'm, I study history. Uh, I looked at the history, and this part of the world has been in conflict since the 17th century because of the strait question. I mean, you know, it, it was the, the Eastern question uh, people talked too much about in the 19th century was about the control of the uh, uh, strait or Turkish strait. So the Montreux Convention solved that. Uh, solved that problem. And it, it has created a, a kind of an equilibrium, a, a kind of a, a modus operandi in the region, which survived the Cold War. And, and let me tell you, nobody likes the Montreux Convention, which makes me to think that it's the best solution. You know, if Russians liked it, I would have doubt, I would have my doubt. If the Americans liked it, I really would have my doubt. But if the Romanians or, or Ukrainians or Turks, well, Turks do like it anyway. Uh, but we have our own questions too. So uh, I think that's because, you know, we have to think the alternative. Uh, if we start talking, let's change Montreal Convention, are you, do you see any possibility in international relations today to getting the Russians and Americans, let alone all the other regional countries, forget everybody else, do you think the Russians and Americans could agree a better uh, a, a way of dealing with the straight question, including uh, also put the, this mix to Turkey as well? So that's almost impossible. So let's make the best use of Montreux instead of uh, Montreux bashing. So that's your answer uh, about Montreux. Uh, regarding the China and, and the cooperation in the region, I totally agree with Anna here uh, because uh, I agree uh, there was, in the best of the times, there was a problem of economic cooperation with the regional countries because of their uh, production bases are not complementary. They are competitive. They, you know, they produce similar products and almost in the similar quali uh, quality. Um, so uh, I don't see, as, as uh, just like Anna, I don't see they are uh, their ability to cooperate to to benefit from this uh, reshoring. Okay. okay. Thank you. Alina, you have the last word before my last word. Yeah, <laughs> of course. Uh, now, very briefly, um, I think one of the things which is not being talked enough in the region is economic cooperation. We talk about security cooperation. Uh, but economic cooperation has been very much, is, is very much lagging behind. Uh, so, yes, of course, I do agree. I, I do agree with Hannah, but I think one of the things that needs to be done and to be taken more seriously is to, is, is to go back to discussing and finding ways to increase economic cooperation. One, on Montreux Convention, where well, there are alternatives, they are called unmanned naval vehicles, and there is a whole... Um, search out there to find uh, to find drones and to find other uh, new technologies which can actually bypass the Montreux Convention and still uh, help with uh, with a naval deterrence in the Black Sea. But otherwise I agree with with Mustafa it's a close discussion nobody wants to have it um, so we have to look for alternative solutions. Well, uh, thank you very much. I've, uh, I thought I knew a lot, but I've learned a lot uh, from the debate and the discussions and uh, lots of food for thought here. And uh, <laughs> maybe we need to, I mean, Alina keeps reminding me that we need to work on a project to move ahead with this. Mustafa and I talk about it also, we've talked about it. An update of our 2020 vision, which uh, maybe it's time to, but uh, even though- 2040 vision now. Uh, 40 vision. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, taking part in this debate to the three speakers uh, that provided their insights and uh, to all of you that have been following us. So we tried our best to answer your questions and uh, to have a nice discussion about the region. And hopefully um, next time we have a discussion, maybe there are some signs that things are more positive. Uh, let's see. Uh, thank you again. This was very good. Thank you.
Thanks, Alina. Thanks, Hannah. And thanks, Mustafa. Thank you for being you. Thank you. Bye bye. The audience. Okay.